Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tasneem Hussain. I'm back again with you to talk about registration and listing deficiency letters. We'll go over a brief overview of our compliance program. What if I get a deficiency letter? What are the important points and what needs to be done? Then we'll go over a case example of a drug listing deficiency. I'll do a live demo and show you how to revise a submission. Then we have a few uh, do's and don'ts for manual overrides. Then we have a few labeler and registrant responsibilities. Then we have a few resources for you to keep handy. As Leila mentioned earlier, our, our compliance program began in 2015, and our mission is to achieve accuracy and integrity of our registration and listing database. We find the errors or the inaccuracies in the system um, and through our surveillance and other notifications and projects, and then we open compliance cases and send out the deficiency letters. We send the letter to the labeler or the registrant contacts. Um, then uh, the information that, you know, the contact information that's submitted to FDA for these labeler or the registrant contacts, these must be accurate. These must be current. The name of the person that's currently um, the contact must be there, and they must uh, send us a proper email address. We cannot tell you how important this is as, as FDA um, contacts and is, you know, communicates with uh, the labor of contact or the registrant contact for any registration or listing uh, data matters. Um, the firm will have 30 days to make corrections. And um, again, uh, to emphasize, we are going to talk about a drug listing deficiency. An example will be our listing deficiency case. So your listing had an error, and FDA sent you a letter. So what do you do now? Well, these next few slides will give you some of the steps here. The first thing and the most important thing is please do not ignore this letter. So you do not want the data to be removed or to have more action taken against your firm. So first thing, uh, read the error statement located in the opening paragraph. It has one sem simple sentence of what the error is. And then at the end of the table, at the end of the letter, there's a table, and that's usually found in the listing deficiency letter. It'll have more information on the error. And then uh, follow the instructions located in the body of the letter, of course. A very important point to remember uh, when you're trying to make corrections, the first thing is to make sure you use the same set ID when making corrections. Uh, do not change the set ID. Um, then make the necessary changes, fix the deficiency that identified in the letter. Um, we'll go over this uh, in much more detail a little bit in our demo section. And uh, also please visit our drug registration and listing webpage where we also have instructions on how to submit updates and um, other important links for your reference. You remember when you send FDA your revised SPLs, the submission may result in one or more automated error messages. So there are validation rules that are set up in the system and it stops the submission for some errors and they must be corrected right away before that uh, submission can be accepted. Or some errors will need a manual override before the submission is accepted. So um, errors can be generated with the first submission or with subsequent updates. For example, um, in a registration SPL, when a firm uh, tries to enter a different DUNS number than what they have in the Dun and Bradstreet for their firm, then the system will stop that submission and it will not pass until the correct DUNS is entered by the firm. For a listing submission, the labeler DUNS must match with the DUNS in the Dun and Bradstreet, and also it has to match with the labeler code request SPL DUNS number that's been submitted to FDA. So um, if you know, the submission, if the DUNS does not match, then the submission will not pass until the firm resubmits with the matching DUNS. Some errors are technical in nature, uh, like issues with formatting or uh, not referencing a JPEG, JPEG image after you have uploaded. Um, some are compliance errors. So these result in, as a firm is trying to submit a change to one of the required key data elements in the SPL. If a firm gets a deficiency letter, uh, for example, for incorrect strength, and they try to submit the revision by including the correct strength in the newer version, the system um, is set up to see that the you know old uh, version and the new version does not match. So then it'll generate an error, and um, this error we'll see more in uh, more detail soon. And this is an example of a compliance error, and this will need a manual override before the submission can pass. So you get an error that won't allow your submission to pass. What should you do? Well, the body of the deficiency letter will tell you to send an email to EDIRLIS. And in the email, you want to include the list of the errors in the core ID or the submission ID. So it depends on the software tool you use. Um, 
whether it will be called the submission ID or the core ID. And you need to include this ID as this is what the compliance officer needs to check your revised submission. By searching under this ID, the officer can see the failed submission and, and check to see everything that you made, uh, make sure that everything is corrected, you know, the error that's identified is corrected, and that no other errors besides the error that you get that needs a manual override is there because every other error um, that doesn't need a manual override should be able to be corrected by the firm before you submit it. And after that, if the only error left is the one that needs a manual override, um, CEDAR will approve that override and then um, this uh, CEDAR's approval needs to be sent to the F SPL coordinator to be actually perform the manual override. So let's look at an example case of a listing error with Wonder Drug. Um, this was submitted by the labeler Wonder Pharma, and this firm is very notorious for making mistakes in submitting their listing data. So, um, so a compliance officer found this error, um, and they, you know, sent the firm Wonder Pharma a, a deficiency letter, um, and then in, they opened a compliance case, and the letter was sent, you know, to the labeler contact. So this is an example of the first paragraph of the letter uh, that was sent to Wonder Pharma, and uh, John Doe was listed as a labeler contact, so we have addressed John Doe in this letter. And the first uh, paragraph shows you the, uh, the error statement, which we have here says, we have found that your listing submission includes a mismatched strength of active ingredient. And then also it says that, you know, the error was um, itemized at the, uh, at the end of this letter. So we look at the end of the letter, and there's a table there. And in the table, you'll find the NDC number will be there, the proprietary name of the drug will be there, and the issue will be highlighted also, um, and sometimes in more detail. So here, um, the issue is that the strength of the active ingredient does not match between the labeling and the listing SPL. The strength in the labeling is found to be 2,000 milligrams, while the strength listed in the SPL is 200 milligrams. So then when we look at the labeling here, this is, uh, the first part is the drug fact section. It says the strength is uh, 2,000 milligrams for the active ingredient. And then also, and you're looking at the, uh, the carton label image, also the strength here is 2,000 milligrams. Then when we look at the SPL, um, we see the coal tar, which is the active ingredient here. Um, the strength is listed to be 200 milligrams, which does not match with the labeling. Okay, so now we're going to look at a demo of uh, using Cedar Direct for this case example of under drug. All right, hi everyone, I'm back. I am going to log in to Cedar Direct with my account number. Great, we're in, and that was the hardest part. <laughs> All right, so now uh, the first thing we said is after you log in, you want to click on the previously uh, submitted uh, listing. Then you want to create new version. So we see that the uh, set ID, we're not going to do anything. We're going to keep it the same. We're not going to generate new. Um, the version number was 2, and now it went to 3, so that's good. So now we go to the product section. And here um, is our product. We click on this icon. And then we get to the product data element section. And then under the ingredient section, you want to click on this uh, ingredient, which is your um, active ingredient. And you can see the strength is 200 milligrams. And so you click on this icon. And then you get to the uh, ingredient details. And this is where you see that the strength is 200. And it should have been 2,000. So we're going to change that to 2,000. And we're not going to change anything else on this screen. And then we're going to click on Save Ingredient. And then um, the screen go goes back to the Product Data Elements screen. And then we're going to do save product. OK. Now, uh, then we're going to do save and validate. 
So now the screen says uh, validation in progress. This is when the system is going through the process, and it'll take a few minutes. And it also says that um, your SPL has been submitted to FDA is waiting additional in-depth validation, and you, uh, they say to check back the status after a few minutes. So right now I'm going to stop this, and we're going to come back after a few minutes. Okay, so we come back after a few minutes, and we check on the status, and it says validation failure. So we click on that. And then um, it says that their errors have occurred, okay? So we need to go to error to click on that and see what the error is. And the area that has the error will normally be highlighted usually like in a pink or red as it is here. So you would click on this icon next to the drug, and then now you see the error that comes up. And the error um, that has generated is that if the NDC product item code was previously submitted, then the active ingredient you need and the active ingredient strength must be the same as in the most recent submission for this NDC product item, if they're, except if there's no marketing status. So um, when you do this, you see that the, um, this error is generated because the system is set up so that because of 207.35, where it states that a change in um, the strength of an active ingredient requires a new NDC product code. Um, thus, this rule was set up so that in, uh, people will not be able to just uh, continue on and try to um, change the strength of a product without changing the NDC. So this error stops the submission. And um, in this case, you are making the correction um, to a previously uh, listed mistake, and you're not trying to change the product code. So um, this NDC is going to need a manual override to pass. And because we asked for the submission ID, um, you have to hit Submit SPL. And for that to happen, you have to save product. And once you save product, then you have save it. Submit SPL, and when you do that, you'll have the submission ID that will be generated, and that's the ID you need to send to us. So we're going to go ahead and hit Submit SPL, and then again, uh, the system will go through this validation processing, and it checks everything. It tells you to wait a few minutes uh, by refreshing or logging back in, and then so we're going to stop right now for a little bit, and then we'll come back when when the status changes again. Okay, so we're back, and as we suspected, the status is back, and it says submission failed. And it failed because that error that we got um, cannot be over, it cannot, you cannot fix that error. You need to get a manual override for that error. So um, we wanted a submission ID to be generated, and here's the submission ID. So you're going to have to copy this submission ID, and you're going to have to send it to us um, send it to us uh, in the email along with the error messages, and we will review it, and we will get back to you, and we will ask for the manual override. Thank you. So as we saw in the demonstration in Cedar Direct, when you tried to change the strength in the SPL from 200 to 2,000, the system detected the error saying that, you know, you're trying to change something. Um, it triggers the internal validation checks and generates automated error message. Um, you know, which is the NDC item code. It was previously submitted, and the active ingredient unis and the strength must be the same as in the most recent submission. Um, so as you know, as we mentioned earlier, um, 20735 says that any changes to an active ingredient requires a new product, uh, NDC product code. And the system is set up on the basis of this rule so that if someone tries to change it, um, without changing the product code, then the error would stop their submission from being accepted. But in your case, you're making a correction due to the deficiency letter. So um, in order for this error to be, uh, to remove this error, the only way is to get a manual override. So before you start to request manual overrides, please read these do's and don'ts. This is really important because manual overrides can take a while, uh, as many of you might know. Um, so please be patient. And if you follow these simple rules, and the process will be a lot less painful for you. So here are the do's. Um, so please do provide a core ID or submission ID when requesting a manual override or requesting a review for approval of a manual override. Please do make sure that the core IDs or submission IDs are prominent and not buried in email traffic. Uh, please provide the ID as text in the body or subject line of an email, email message so that it's able to be copied. Uh, please make sure that the, the request is very clear and does not have confusing or 
contradictory details. Um, please make sure that the manual override request emails um, with, uh, with manual override request emails uh, messages with multiple core IDs or submission IDs are preferred to be formatted as one core ID submission per manual override request. So here are the do nots. Please uh, do not include a core ID or submission ID as part of a screen image as these will not be accepted. Uh, do not add barely legible images of screens, etc., included as supported material because your request for manual override may not be accepted. Uh, please provide, um, do not provide, do not provide inaccurate or incomplete data at the time of request. Uh, do not have discrepancies in the stated error and the number of issues in the actual error messages. Do not provide a partial core ID or submission ID. Do not reference a previous message without including that message as an attachment. Do not send multiple requests. Um, do not skip the subject line and do not have a subject line which is not related to the message in the content. So all these do nots will only cause delays in response to your request. And uh, the case will be closed when you do all of the steps that we've talked about. Um, you know, follow the instructions, make the revisions. If an override is needed, um, and it needs, uh, if the override is needed and you send us the request, and if the override is performed, and uh, new SPL will be uploaded, and then you'll be notified, and the compliance case will be closed. So um, just in other words, the case will only be closed when all revisions are completed and the new data is accurate. So here are some labeler and registrant responsibilities. So um, failure to list the drug properly is going to render the drug misbranded. Um, this is also found in the, in the de deficiency letter. Um, it's important to remember that FDA communicates with the labeler or the registrant contact for the establishment, registration, and drug listing matters. Uh, we have mentioned this before many times, and it's so important that we need to remind you again that uh, the contact information that you provide uh, in the label code request, uh, in the you know the registration um, SPL, everywhere you have a contact information, please make sure that the contact information is current and that the the email is current and correct. Um, if there's any kind of change to a contact information, this information has to be updated within 30 days of the change. Some firms don't change it ever. Uh, a, you know, an employee will leave and six months later, um, you know, we send some kind of a email or communication. It never gets to the firm because the person is no longer there. So it's very important that you please update your contact information. Um, and this uh, also says, the letter also tells you that this is not an all-inclusive letter, so that there may be more errors um, found in your listing other than the one we identified. So it's your responsibility to determine whether your firm and its products are in compliance with applicable laws. So then here are some uh, good resources to review and keep in handy. Um, this is our Electronic Code of Federal Regulations, um, has part 207 in there for registration and listing. Um, the registration and listing instruction page. Then we have our compliance program page, and in that there is a strength conversion drug listing uh, document that's very helpful um, when you have questions about um, strengths for different dosage forms. And then we also have this SPL uh, validation guides um, procedure. And this has all the information about all the validation procedures that you could ever want to know. And that's all we have for you right now. So um, thank you for listening. Thank you for attending. And please let us know if you have any questions. Um, we can answer them during the question and answer session, or you can always email us at this address. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great presentation. The next session will be on the U.S. Agents Verification Initiative and Listing and Activation Project. Please join me in welcoming back our speakers for this session, Leila Raju Efandieri and Paul Loback. As mentioned uh, before, one of our more recent uh, compliance projects was the U.S. Agent Verification Initiative, which we will be briefly discussing in this presentation. 
In this presentation, we go through U.S. agent requirements and responsibilities, uh, the pandemic and some of the challenges that we faced, um, U.S. agent verification, verification initiative, uh, what uh, to do next if you receive one of our letters, and what happens if no actions are taken and no corrections are made. And we end with some useful tips as usual. Although all um, establishments are required to have an official contact included on the registration SPL, um, the uh, foreign drug manufacturing facilities are required to also include um, a U.S. agent on the registration SPL. Um, the requirements for U.S. agents are outlined in 21 Code of Federal Regulations Part 207.69. B, um, and all registrants of foreign establishments must designate one sing single U.S. agent, um, and um, this U.S. agent must reside or maintain a place of business in the United States. It cannot be a mailbox, answering machine, or service, or other place uh, where a person acting as a U.S. agent is not physically present. Um, U.S. agent responsibilities include reviewing, disseminating, routing, and responding to all communications from FDA, including emergency communications, responding to questions concerning those drugs that are imported or offered, offered for import to the United States. Uh, they must assist FDA in scheduling inspections. Um, in addition, if FDA is unable to contact a foreign registrant directly, or expeditiously, FDA may provide the information or document to the United States agent, which um, basically is equivalent to providing the same information or document to the foreign establishment themselves. With the coronavirus um, pandemic of 2019, uh, a national public health emergency was declared in January of 2020. Uh, with that, we faced an influx of new labeler code requests, um, and there was a spike in registration and listing data submissions to FDA. Some of the challenges that we faced at this time was that um, we had difficulty reaching some of the registrants at such a crucial time. Um, or in some cases, we would reach the company um, and the answer we would get was that, oh, we really are not uh, US, uh, the U.S. agent. We are included as a U.S. agent, but we can't um, assist you uh, with any information in reference to importation or um, scheduling and inspection. Um, and in some cases, the U.S. agent um, wasn't a U.S. entity or business, so they were not physically present in the United States, as is required by law. Um, and in some other cases, the U.S. agent um, was included on a registration SPL without any kind of agreement or business relationship um, uh, with the registered establishment. FDA publishes U.S. agent information as part of the larger registration data on its drug establishment current registration site. Um, it is not included in the searchable file. It is included in the downloadable file in a zip format. Um, this information is available to public and um, companies um, and some U.S. agents um, have been looking through it and contacted FDA um, uh, about the unauthorized use of um, their name on registration SPL of some foreign establishment registrations. A short time after that, we started our verification initiative uh, for U.S. agents. Um, generally speaking, FDA contacts U.S. agents for different reasons. For example, uh, when we have a new labeler code uh, request from a foreign um, entity, um, sometimes for some verification, we need to reach out those U.S. agents or uh, when we are contacting um, those companies for registration and listing deficiencies, amongst other reasons. Um, if we have reason to believe that the U.S. agent information is inaccurate or outdated, uh, we open a compliance case and we send a deficiency letter. And again, it depends on um, if 
the information is included on a labeler code SPL or on a registration SPL, the deficiency letter can be sent to the labeler contact or the registrant contact. Here I included a copy of the U.S. Agent Deficiency Template, um, and in it, um, obviously, it's, it's uh, fine print, so you can't read the entire um, body of the email, but it uh, has information um, assisting you on um, how to send us those corrections, um, and it includes a table which um, um, details the um, U.S. Agent information that you have included either on the registration SPL or on the labeler code SPL. So what to do next if you receive one of those um, letters? And that depends on uh, what situation exactly you're in. If uh, you are still manufacturing drugs for U.S. commercial distribution and importing it into the U.S., um, it might be um, just a case of um, you now have a new U.S. agent. So all you have to do is you access the labeler code SPL or registration SPL or both, um, and uh, you remove the outdated information. You include the new um, U.S. agent and um, submit the data to FDA. Um, there is also a possibility that you no longer manufacture or import drugs for U.S. commercial distribution. Um, as it was discussed in the deregistration portion of the workshop uh, earlier this morning, uh, you are required to deregister with FDA. Uh, once you deregister, uh, you should delist the drugs that you no longer manufacture for U.S. commercial distribution, and um, you have to include the last lot expiration date um, as the marketing end date of the listed product. Um, it's always also good practice to inactivate your labeler code um, in case um, you have deregistered with FDA and you do not have any drugs um, listed with us. Um, and remember that um, if you no longer manufacture or import drugs uh, to U.S., um, the mere fact that you communicate that through an email in response to the letter that we have sent you um, is not going to close the case. You have to take care of all these steps uh, in order for us to close the case um, against the data. If you receive one of those letters and you don't take any actions, um, uh, you, we can move forward with an activating of uh, your labeler code uh, and subsequently all drug listings under that labeler code. Um, if the um, uh, deficient um, data is written reference to a registration SPL, then your establishment registration can be inactivated. And you also have to remember that any uh, data inactivation that is initiated by FDA can only be reversed by FDA once a case is closed. Um, and, um, and, you know, in contrast, uh, the industry-initiated labor code inactivation uh, can be reversed um, if and when manufacturing and importing drugs resume. So by inactivating your labeler code once uh, you no longer need it, if you decide that you uh, want to manufacture and import drugs into U.S. again, you can basically renew your registration, uh, relist those drugs and um, uh, under a reactivated labeler code, which you can do um, very quickly and effectively um, from your end. Uh, we close the presentation uh, with some useful tips. Um, you have to remember that a change in U.S. agent, um, depending on the type of business, should be reported through labeler code SPL and or registration SPL. For example, if you are a private label distributor um, that uh, is outside of the U.S., uh, you have um, a labeler code SPL to update. You should not be registered with FDA, so therefore there is no registration SPL. And if you are a foreign uh, manufacturing establishment, uh, you have both the labeler code SPL and the registration SPL to update in case you change your U.S. agent. Um, also, if um, you are, in fact, um, the U.S. agent representing a foreign manufacturing facility or private label distributor, um, and, um, and you are included um, 
on the registration or labeler code SBL as the U.S. agent, you must assume all responsibilities, as we earlier discussed, um, under 21 CFR 207.69B. Uh, uh, for example, you can't uh, refuse assisting FDA in scheduling inspections. The other point I wanted to make is that uh, the official contact and U.S. agent are usually two different entities. Uh, so the official contact, um, again, is, is required for all establishments, whether if you are a domestic or a foreign entity. But um, uh, in the case of uh, foreign establishments, uh, you have two different contacts included. One is the official contact for each establishment and then the U.S. agent. Um, although the official contact um, is not required to be present um, at the location, it's usually someone that uh, is an employee of the company and has direct knowledge of uh, some uh, crucial information that FDA is seeking. So we are hoping that you have um, provided two different contact information that are knowledgeable about all those different responsibilities that they have, and they can assist us um, in um, providing information um, as needed. Um, as we have mentioned time and time again throughout this presentation and workshop, um, do not ignore our verification and deficiency letters. Um, I'm going to turn it to Paul for um, the drug listing and activation presentation. And um, I think sometime later uh, after the session, we are going to take your questions. Thanks again for your time and attention. Thank you and hello again, this is Paul Lobach and I'd like to take this opportunity to review our drug listing inactivation initiative. This subject is not new and it is not the first time we've presented this subject at the workshop. However, it bears repeating as FDA continues to inactivate thousands of drug listing records on an annual basis. It is our goal to reduce that number significantly by continuing to remind registrants of their obligation to renew and update all drug listing data. Having said that, this initiative may still be new and novel to some of our audience. So here's some background. Section 510B requires that all establishments register annually during our October to December registration renewal period. Section 510J, which is the part that requires registrants to submit drug listing, also requires that they delist any discontinued products and update other drug listings for which there is a change to data. Despite the statutory requirements, here's what companies were actually doing. Many companies would list a product initially, then never update it again. Maybe it was a one-time import. Maybe it was a one-time or short-term repackaging contract. Some companies didn't know about the update requirements or weren't as concerned with keeping all data up to date, so long as imports processing, reimbursement, and insurance payments continued for current products. Company may have ceased drug operations, but assigned no one to submit the discontinuances or delistings or perhaps an underlying contract manufacturer or API manufacturer deregistered or failed to renew registration without informing the owner or marketer of the drug. Now remember, since registrants were only required to update when something changed, FDA had to consider these older, non-updated listings as active. And I remind you, our electronic listings go back to 2009, late 2009, but some of our paper listings went back as many as 20 years or more. So what did FDA do about it? In 2016, we updated the regulation to effectively implement an annual listing renewal requirement. I won't read the whole thing, but I've highlighted the essential parts. For each listed drug, the registrant must certify that no changes have occurred if nothing has occurred since the last review and update. Further, for companies with lots of listings, 
they can make a single no changes certification submission during the annual registration update applicable to all of the registrants listed drugs. As a result, there is now an annual requirement to update each of your listings or at least certify that no changes have occurred, similar to the registration requirements. And I note that if, uh, if you have updated any listing during the calendar year, you do not have to certify it again in the fall. The regulation was published in 2016 and implemented in 2017. By 2019, after a few years of outreach to teach industry about the new requirement, FDA decided to begin a process of inactivating old records that hadn't been updated or certified. We announced in the Federal Register in August of 2019 our intention to begin inactivating drug listing records beginning in September of 2019. Then, for future years, reoccurring rounds of inactivation each January and July. We started with the oldest, the ones that hadn't been updated for years, then gradually moved forward to anything that hadn't been updated or certified in the required period of time. In all, more than 50,000 records were inactivated that first pass through. Here's a breakdown of that initial batch. Of all NDC product codes, which were candidates initially for inactivation, about 29,000 had not been updated in more than five years, and around 10,000 more were three to five years old. This proportion held up with the finished drug listings published in the NDC directory at the time as well. This does not include paper listings because those records were not transferred to the new database when electronic listing had been required in late 2009. Consequently, any NDC from a paper listing, but not updated since in the electronic system, was already at least 10 years old. Note also that the 46,000 total listings in July of 2019, when the analysis was performed, is much lower than the 50,000 total, which were ultimately inactivated. More than 4,000 additional listings went unupdated and uncertified in 2019. Looking a little deeper into that less than three years old category, we saw an interesting breakdown of marketing categories. Most of the products were various kinds of unapproved drugs and included unfinished drugs. So concerns about affecting patient access to drugs were greatly alleviated. An analysis of the approved drugs, NDAs, BLAs, and ANDAs, revealed that the lion's share of those were repackaged versions of other drugs that were otherwise available and certified. Further consultation with our drug shortages staff also helped ensure that patient access to medications was not disrupted. If you remember the slide about the 2019 Federal Register Notice, there was some language about July inactivations. Here's what was in the FR Notice, specifically noting the blue text, in addition, every July thereafter, FDA will begin to inactivate human drug listings that remain active and certified after the June listing update, but still contain at least one establishment that is not currently registered. Why do we have a July round of inactivations? Well, the certification process contains an unavoidable loophole. The window to both register and certify drug listing is October 1st through December 31st. So a private label distributor, PLD, or a finished drug manufacturer can certify the drug listing at any time during that window, including prior to the renewal of the registration of an underlying manufacturer. However, any of the underlying establishments in the supply chain could fail to, the, to renew its registration by December 31st. Consequently, on January 1st, such a listing could be immediately deemed misbranded for being manufactured at an unregistered establishment. Now, since the statute requires listing updates every June and December, 
FDA allows companies with listings described above until the June update deadline to get the establishment registered or identify a new one. Therefore, in July, we activate those active listings, which are still linked to an unregistered establishment. We follow the same basic process for both the January and July rounds of inactivation. We send a list of proposed inactivations to the Drug Shortage Staff, DSS, for Shortage Consult, and separately contact the labeler of any product flagged by DSS. We also send a standard notification of inactivation email to all companies with a product in jeopardy of inactivation. The email is sent to the contact for the labeler code of the drug listings NDC. So let this be another reminder for you to keep your contact information on the labeler code up to date. The email usually provides two to three weeks of notice before inactivation, and it will identify all the product NDCs under that labeler code in jeopardy of inactivation. Now companies can request an extension if they're experiencing difficulty in making the update. Sometimes, for example, an update to listing requires a manual override of the validations for the submissions, which can take some time for the FDA to process. Ultimately, though, any product listing that is inactivated can be immediately reactivated with a full, updated, and corrected listing submission. A marketing category breakdown of this year's January inactivations shows only about 8,400 product NDCs total compared to the original and more than 50,000 product listings from the previous year. It's a significant reduction, but it was still much higher than we anticipated. This past July saw an unusual mix and still quite a high number of inactivated product NDCs. This graph shows a distribution by product type or SPL document type. As you can see, OTC products, both monograph and unapproved, comprise well over 80% of the inactivations. So in summary, there is an annual requirement to review and renew your drug listing data. Each January, the FDA identifies and inactivates listings which are not updated during the previous calendar year nor certified within the October to December registration renewal period. Each July, FDA identifies and inactivates current listings which are still linked to at least one unregistered establishment. Prior notification is always sent to the labeler code contacts for any listing in jeopardy of being inactivated to allow for an update. And ultimately, any product listing that is inactivated can be immediately reactivated with a full and corrected listing submission. Finally, and in short, please review your drug listing data frequently. FDA inactivation of the drug listing is not the same as delisting your product and do not rely on inactivation to fulfill your obligation to delist. Registrants are still required by law to delist products when they discontinue manufacturing for commercial distribution. Good afternoon. Thank you for the great presentations. In our final session, we'll work through a submission troubleshooting exercise provided by Julian Chun, who's a pharmacist with the Drug Registration and Listing Staff at Cedar's Office of Compliance. The Q&A panel will follow the exercise. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chun. Hi everyone, um, so this is a live exercise. Um, congratulations for making it this far in the workshop. I know it's been a long day. Uh, this is um, designed to be interactive, so um, to get you guys some practice on everything that you've learned. 
Um, let's move on to the next slide here. So basically, what I want you guys to take out of this presentation is I want you guys to be able to identify and properly list co-packaged or combination drug products. So this is going to be the focus of this case study because we are finding a lot of errors associated with kit listings, combined, uh, uh, combination products, and um, co-packaged products. Um, I want you guys to be able to troubleshoot the drug, drug listing issues and um, also to be able to, or we missed the other one, uh, let's see. Yeah, identify and fix submitted SPLs um, once you have it. So let's move on to the next slide. Sorry for the technical glitches. This is live, so um, I am not a recording. All right, so this uh, combination uh, product or kit, um, this is the third slide. You already have a test. So um, for uh, the next, go ahead and put the items out. Okay, so birth control pills, is, is that a combination product or kit? Go ahead and use your chat box, let me know what do you think. Is that the, the typical birth control pills, is it um, multiple drug strengths, inert tablets, do you think that's a would be classified as a combination product or as a kit? Uh, how about a pre-filled syringe? Do you think that would be considered a combination product or a kit. All right, I'm seeing a lot of mixed ones. All right. So next point, bullet point. How about these co-package products here? Would they be considered kits, combination products? Does it make a difference if the co-package products are two drugs? One drug, one biologic in it, one drug, one device, does that make a difference? Does it, would you consider it a combination product or a kit? And let's see what you guys are rolling out here. Okay. All right. So there's uh, differences in some of the answers. That's good. So it's going to show that this one uh, presentation will be useful. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay. So combination product. Um, this is the official definition in the regulations. So when we say combination product, the way FDA looks at it is a combination, it's a combination product if it's uh, regulated by two different centers. So if it's all drugs, we don't consider that um, a combination product because it's only CEDAR that is regulating it. But if it's mixed centers, then it's a combination product. And it also has to um, it also has to have these features. So it needs to be two or more regulated drug products um, combined into a single entity. So the pre-filled syringe, for example, that one is a drug inside a device. So it's combined into one item that would be considered a regulated product. Um, the second point, if it's two or more separated products, that's packaged together, that's also a combination product. And again, it should be in um, uh, regulated by two separate, um, that should be regulated by two separate sensors. Um, the third point is, okay, if it's uh, products packaged separately, but it the labeling state, it's intended to be used together, um, that, means that's also a combination product. And then the last point is if it's an inv investigational drug product um, that's packaged separately, but also proposed to be labeled together, that's a combination product. Okay, next slide. Okay, so let's test your uh, knowledge here. So birth control pills we were talking about, all the components are drugs. Um, so it is not a combination product. So, um, but because a birth control packet has multiple uh, drugs in it sometimes, or the same drug, different strengths, um, and it may include inert tablets, you would list this as a kit. 
So each drug part um, and strength is one part of the kit, and then the inert will be another part of the kit. So that's the one um, for birth controls. The next bullet point, pre-filled syringe. So that's um, a drug inside a device, and we already mentioned that that's considered a combination drug because it's a drug that's um, put inside a device. Um, in this case, you would just list it regularly, and meaning you would just put in the drug type, and then in the packaging section, that's where you would indicate that it's a combination product. Next slide. Okay, now how about the co-package and convenience kits? So if it's two or more regulated products packaged together, but everything's all drugs, it's not considered a combination product, but in order for you to list all the different components, you list it as a kit. So you eat, input each drug product as a part. Now, uh, similarly, a drug and biologic um, combination, it is considered a combination product, and in order for you to be able to uh, list out all the different components, you use it, you list it as a kit, and then you input each part, each drug part and each biologic part as a kit. Now the next um, combination, let's wait for the uh, slide to, to flip, there we go, is a drug device component. So this is also considered a, a combination product. However, the, um, the SPLs, you can only list out the drug components. So you you're, won't be able to input in the device components like syringes or um, applic uh, applications or inhalers or whatnot. Those won't be able to be listed within the SPL. So if it's only one drug in the in the co-package product, then you list out the you list it out regularly with the drug component, and then you would mention the device portions in the content of labeling. If it's different, if it's multiple drugs and devices, then you would list out the different drugs as parts in a kit, and then mention the devices in the content of labeling. And then, as with all the combination products, you classify the combination type in the packaging section. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is where we move to the case study portion. So we'll do an example with a kit listing. So let's say you receive a deficiency letter from FDA. What does the deficiency letter state? And uh, next bullet point. And what, what steps do you take to resolve the deficiency? So these are the things that I, I want you guys to be thinking about. And then next slide. Okay, so what I want you guys to do is now I want you guys to take the time, open up the case study package, and then review the, the deficiency letter in there, and then also the, um, the cut and pasted portions of the Cedar Direct SPL sections. So um, let's get the rest of the bullets up out there. Um, so now what's important is that I want you guys to use the chat only for questions or clarifications for right now. Some of you guys I know are great students and may have already looked at the case study um, packet during your lunch or beforehand, so kind of have a good idea of what the answers are, but don't use that yet. Don't spoil the surprise yet for everyone. So I want you guys to kind of use this time to do the case study look at the packets and then but if you do have questions use the chat and then and then I'll address it and then later we'll address uh, address the questions so at this point let's go to the case study packet so then I can just walk you through it a little bit as you guys read and study through it okay so let's see this is the um, deficiency letter, as uh, my colleague Tasneem has shown you, it's pretty standard and um, the, f the thing you should pay most attention to is the 
first paragraph, which details out the errors that we found. So if you scroll down the middle paragraphs, it's basically, it's a lot of legalese, um, but if this is the first time you're receiving a deficiency letter, you should read that carefully because it really details out what's at stake and what you need to know about how to correct it and also what are the consequences if you don't. So um, keep scrolling down. And at the very end of the letter, we just put the, uh, summarize what it is that we, what deficiencies we found um, and which drugs it is. So that's the standard template for a, a deficiency letter. Um, whatever you guys receive will be very similar to that. And in this case, we told you your Wonder Drug Kit has an issue, and the issues are that it's got an invalid application number or regulatory citation, and it's got an, 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 an invalid NDC assignment. So we found two errors with your kit. All right, so let's scroll down a little bit. And this is your kit listing that you have in Cedar Direct. There's the label and the content of labeling. And then this is the product data elements that you have. So if you see um, the NDC code assignment at the top, the dosage form where it says kit, that's how you list using kits. That, that's going to tell Cedar Direct that you're going to have different parts and it'll allow you to enter different parts. The, um, if you look down a little bit, the marketing details is where you are um, have to give the marketing authority, like what um, regulatory citation or application number are you using to cite it? So in this case, for the whole kit, you're saying that it's and uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's that application number that you're using to cite it. And then within it, right below, you have the two parts, your wonder wipes and your wonder drugs. Um, and then right below that is the packaging for the whole kit. So the next page. And here's part one, the wipes part. And here's where you input um, one part of your kit. So in it is the wonder wipes. And similarly to the whole kit, you uh, input in the marketing details. And in this case, you're in the mar under marketing category, you're saying you're using, you're marketing this product uh, using the OTC monograph. And that monograph was published in part 333A. Uh, you list out the ingredients, um, any characteristics, and then the packaging associated with it. And then let's scroll down a little bit. There's the, there's the packaging associated with it. Um, and this is under combination product type. This is where you would input the type of combination product if it was a combination product. Um, and then that's that packaging level per, for part one. Now moving on for part two, the, um, this is where you have the wonder drug part, the drug part of your listing. And this is where you would input also the marketing category right below and the marketing details. And in this case, you're saying that it's your uh, marketing, just bringing this drug product into the market using the marketing authority of a um, abbreviated new drug application. And that application was approved under ANDA 123456. Next page. And in it, you have to list out the ingredients, active and inactives, the characteristics, and the packaging where you assign the NDCs. And in this case, and the one, two, three, four, five, six is a made up application number, but um, each application number is associated with a drug. And for this exercise, and the one, two, three, four, five, six is associated with that acetaminophen and this um, fever reducing drug product. And then we just scroll down to the very end of the case study product. Um, all right, we're already at the end. There's the NDC 
um, that's assigned to that part. And then that's where you, and, and then that's where you kind of have to look through this whole thing that you guys should have and then try to decide, well, where are the errors right now? We went through that whole thing. Where was the invalid NDC assignment? Where, where was the um, invalid application number or regulatory citation? And think that through. I'll give you guys a few minutes and then I'll look through the case study chat for any questions regarding this case. And after that, we'll go through the answers. Okay, so then again, the, your case study chat is where you're able to ask me any clarifying questions. And it, and it seems like I explained the case so well that nobody has any clarifying questions. So let's just move on to the resolution. All right, so let's um, go through the listing deficiency procedures. What I feel like you should should be your SOPs when you get a listing deficiency letter from FDA. So, okay, review the listing and look for specific issues. So we already told you what the issue was, so review your listing and look look for it specifically. And this is what you should have done um, with the case the case study packets. Next step. Correct that specific issue once you find it, but don't just stop there. Take the time to review the rest of the listing for accuracy. So the way we do listing surveillance, we look for specific issues in general. When we find it in listings, we alert you, but it doesn't mean we actually reviewed your entire listing initially. But when you submit the corrections, we will, the compliance officer associated with your listing will review your entire listing at that time. And if we find other errors, then that's going to delay the resolution of your case and it's going to extend the amount of time your drug will, will be marked as um, has it, having compliance issues. So the next step after that is after you fix the specific issues and reviewed it, then you save and validate. And this is a nice feature in Cedar Direct because um, if you submit it without validating it first, that could take 15 minutes, 30 minutes, depending on how busy e-list is. And then if it rejects, then you're gonna have to start the whole process. So always save and validate first, that way you can fix little issues. And then the last step is to submit that SPL. Okay, so um, the next, and then yeah, if there is any um, need for a manual override, then follow the procedures and my colleagues have already talked about that, so I won't belabor the point here. All right, so the case study deficiency number one, what we told you number one. So let's look at the um, different, different bullet points here, so okay. Wonder Pharma says 
they want to market a kit. Um, and they said that they're marketing this kit under ANDA 123456, which I said was for acetaminophen as a fever reducer. Then inside the kit, they have the part one, which is hand sanitizers. And they're saying that they're marketing that using monograph part 333A and also the fever reducer, which they're also saying is um, marketing, getting marketed through an application number and the 123456. Next slide, please. Okay, so we said that, that there's a issue with the wrong application number on there. So next bullet points. So when you cite an application number in your listing, it means you manufactured that drug exactly as detailed in the application. So you submit to FDA, um, this is the drug, this is how we're going to make it, this is how we're going to use it. That's what you're saying in your listing when you cite that specific application number. Next point. Um, and similarly, when you cite an OTC monograph, it means you manufactured that drug product exactly as it's detailed out in the monograph. So what's published, it tells you how you can label it and what active ingredients you can use. So when you're saying um, you're citing that OTC monograph part, it means you're making it as it's detailed in the monograph. So unless um, the monograph specifically details all the component components of the kit, the entire kit should not use the citation of the part. Similarly, if unless the application specifically details out all the parts of the uh, kit, then it shouldn't be used as 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 an application number for the whole kit. So if the kit is just something you're putting together as a convenience kit or as a uh, co-packaged product, the kit should be listed as an unapproved drug. The kit should not use uh, OTC monograph or an application number of a part for the whole kit. So just remember that the kit should be the whole kit should be used as an under, should be listed as an unapproved drug other if and not use the uh, application number or the OTC monograph of any of the parts. So this is where this uh, case went wrong. Next slide. All right, so the next deficiency we found is that, okay, Wonder Kit is listed, the whole kit is listed with this NDC. The part one was listed. Let's get the next bullet points. I apologize for the little blips coming up. And the part one is uh, list the hand sanitizer is listed using that NDC 555-10, and then the fever reducer is used uh, is listed using the NDC 555-11. So what do you guys think is wrong with that? Let's find out. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is an invalid assignment because, um, next bullet points please. NDC products code must be different if there's a change in active pharmaceutical ingredients, the strengths of the APIs, the dosage forms, the drug status, or any distinguishing characteristics. So in this case, the kit used a product code of 555 for all three of them, but all three of them are, th it's three different products. The first product is a wipe with an alcohol API. The second part is a, a, a tablet fever reducer with acetaminophen as an API. And the third product is the entire kit itself, which includes two APIs. So therefore all three of them need to use different product codes and therefore it makes it that the NDC assignment is not correct. So um, in summary, 
we really require you um, to have very accurate listing information because we use it throughout FDA to support programs such as drug shortages, um, our inspection programs, um, and the supply chain, but also the um, the public has access to it. Consumers and healthcare provider use this drug information, and if it contains errors, uh, that could be detrimental. So accurate data definitely does benefit everyone. And so if you have specific questions, just go ahead and email our EaterList um, mailbox, and then it will find its way to me or anyone um, that can handle the question a bit better. And again, if you have specific questions about Cedar Direct, then we can do that. Or you can email the Cedar Direct help desk and they can answer the more technical questions for you. So um, at this time, we can take questions and follow the agenda. Thank you for that great presentation. Uh, we'll now move into our final Q&A session. And to moderate our final Q&A session, we're welcoming back our speakers for this afternoon's sessions and Paul Loback. Welcome, Paul. Hello, thank you. And uh, thank you all for, as Julian said, for uh, sticking it out this far. We are going to be, excuse me real quick, sorry, always love it when your dog starts barking when you go live. Um, <laughs> the uh, We will be actually de uh, designating uh, 30 minutes to sort of a, a nice clearing house of all the questions we've received in the afternoon and, and even we're going to get to some that came up uh, in the morning that we couldn't get to. Um, I'm happy to have all the panelists here. Um, from the afternoon sessions, and um, they, I guarantee you they're going to get your, your questions answered here. Uh, one panelist is not with us. He could not make the afternoon Q&A session. That was uh, Captain Matt Brancasio, who gave the, uh, the OMUFA, the OTC monograph uh, user fees presentation. He did direct us, though, or instructed us uh, to tell you to direct all questions related to OMUFA, to uh, do I pay a fee, what happens if I do this, how does that affect my fee, anything OMUFA related, please direct those questions to the email box, C-D-E-R collections, all one word, that's Cedar Collections at fda.hhs.gov. And I'll have at the end of the Q&A session for closing remarks, I'll have a final slide with that and some other helpful email addresses on. But for now, just for those of you who are perhaps waiting or hoping to hear the questions related to OMUFA, um, uh, we won't be addressing those here. Um, another question that came up a couple of times actually more than a couple, and I don't know if it was the same person trying to ask it or multiple uh, companies, people uh, asking it, but uh, the question was essentially, do analytical labs uh, register and list? Uh, if all your company does is test other products, um, any type of sample analysis and all that, uh, and uh, physical analysis, um, do you register and list? Yes, you register. Um, the testing lab itself does not have any products to be listed, but those products that you test should reference your testing, your analytical establishment in their drug listing. So um, I hope that knocks out a number of questions uh, together at once. And we will now proceed. Um, I'm going to start off, since we had a lot of uh, questions and we spoke a lot this afternoon, about manual overrides. I'd like to invite uh, Troy Ku to be ready to unmute himself. And Troy, can you just again review, summarize the manual override process? What does somebody do to request a manual override? Who do they send it to? Um, how uh, do they send it to eDuralist, to SPL, to Cedar Direct? How long does it take? Who 
authorizes it and, and all that good stuff. Thank you, Paul. So first, I want to start out our office, what is the e dollars? We do not um, um, responsible for the manual override. So all override, we have to send to the SBL coordinator, which is the SBL at fda.hhs.gov. However, when you request for an override and you submit it to the CEDA direct, we are, you can send it to us. We'll be happy to review all the requests and make sure that you have everything you needed before we submit it. Uh, an override request for you. Now, if you submit it to other tool like ESG, uh, XFORM, Primatic, those have to go directly to the SBL coordinator. The reason for that was because we do not have access to those SBL files to review them. Only what come into CEDA Direct. I hope that helped. Yes, and so I, I'll, the, I was going to say, how long does it take, and is there anything that uh, a company can do if it's taking a long time? Who should they check with? Uh, who can they yes, so yes, so to I, check I on status? Right, so yes. Um, so let's say you already submit a request, and it's been weeks or months, and you haven't heard back from uh, either us or the SPL team, the best uh, office to, to follow up on those is the um, the SBL coordinator, which is the SBL at uh, fda.hhf.gov. Now, if you, if we the one who submit the um, uh, the request, you can, I mean, you can send it to us as well, but uh, normally I would direct them to go to the SBL coordinator because, you know, they, they have better um, answer for you. Yeah, and I'll just add to that that um, please remember, as it was mentioned, the, the requests are processed. Once, once granted, um, as we said, it, uh, each manual override takes a lot of resources, takes a lot of time for someone to review, and they are usually answered in the order that, that's received, and, and there, there really is no way to prioritize one over the other. We understand that sometimes there's a an import uh, shipment waiting to go through on a on a correction that needs to be made. Uh, we we try to end we try to process these as fast as we can, but know that it takes a long time and it just um, behooves you guys out there in the audience um, to check up on your listings and correct these things as soon as you find errors uh, and uh, review your data regularly so that when you really need it to be correct and something's being evaluated, you don't experience these delays. So uh, thanks for that, Troy. Um, Layla, the next, since we had a lot of discussion on kits, both on with uh, Julian's um, presentation here, the exercise, and I mentioned kits quite a bit in, uh, in my combination products presentation. Can you, again, just briefly describe, summarize, what is a kit? Uh, where We have a couple questions about where the NDCs go on the kit. Um, what if all the underlying parts are already listed? Do you have to have, list the thing as a kit also? Um, just if you can just sort of review the general idea of and uh, what goes into listing a kit. Um, thanks for the question. I, I will try to summarize everything very quickly um, and answer all the points, um, the questions that, that were asked. Um, a kit, um, so, so I just want to clarify, when we talk about kits, we're talking about a kit for the purpose of drug registration and listing. Um, so kit has uh, different meanings in different parts of FDA probably, but um, for, for our purpose, it's, it is something that is uh, mostly repackaged or uh, includes different parts um, from which at least one part is a drug. So pay attention. We, we need to have at least one drug part for it to uh, be required to be listed with CEDAR. Um, so the, it has... Um, more than one part, um, at least one drug part. It can have several drug parts, as 
um, Dr. Chan um, um, very well included in his um, case study, um, there are there are differences between a kit and combination product, but um, it can um, if if for example if all the parts are drugs, uh, then you're not dealing with a combination product. It, it's all um, different drugs co-packaged together. Um, an example can be a, a, a first aid kit. Um, it can include other things such as medical device um, or medical food. In the case of medical device or biologics, it can make it a combination product. So I just want to have everyone think about um, all those different scenarios uh, when you're trying to list your product. It is very important for you to, before starting your listing process to determine if your product is a kit or not and, and list it accordingly. Uh, when you list the product, um, you have to have an NDC assigned to the overall kit. And then the drug parts should have their own NDCs. Um, and um, as, as Dr. Chan mentioned, the NDC assigned to the parts should be different than the NDC assigned to the kit because legally we're talking about two different products. The kit is a different legal product than uh, the drug parts um, included in it. So therefore, if, uh, for example, there is a, an application number assigned to a drug part, if uh, FDA has reviewed one of the drugs included in the kit, um, but not the entire kit under that application, the kit itself cannot be listed using that marketing authorization that is assigned to the drug part. So uh, please pay attention to all of those. Um, in, in reference to the NDC, again, um, as um, you probably know, under uh, 21 CFR 201, um, inclusion of an NDC on a drug label is not a requirement. Um, although we encourage you to do it uh, for prescription drugs, there are uh, certain requirements under the um, DSCSA and, um, and barcode rules, which uh, include the NDC, which is embedded in it. So that's a little bit different, but uh, generally speaking, um, the NDC is not required to appear on any drug label um, except for the prescribing information, um, you know, for, for approved labeling. Um, so what we expect to see is even if you do not include the NDC, we're hoping that you do, but if you, if you choose not to include the NDC on a kit um, label, and its drug parts, um, the NDCs nevertheless should be included. They should be assigned NDCs because they, they are drugs, uh, because they are in, they include at least one drug part. Um, so the kit has, have an, has to have an NDC assigned to it once listed, and the parts should have their own NDC assigned to them. If you are co-packaging different products from um, different sources, so you're not co-packaging your own products, the labeler codes can, can be different, the products can be listed separately um, as standalone products if they are also in the market as standalone products and they're listed separately. Uh, but the kit nevertheless, as I mentioned, is a, a different legal entity. It has to be listed on its own with its own assigned NEC number. Thank you for that, and I'll underscore also uh, something that Layla just said. Um, if the underlying, even if the underlying components are, or one of them or more of them are approved or are OTC monograph compliant, we had a couple of questions about this, um, that does not necessarily mean that the overall kit is approved or is monograph compliant. Um, you need to check uh, with the review division uh, that gave the approval of the underlying product, if if appropriate, and and ask or or and request if that approval carries forward, uh, or if if you're asking about compliance with a monograph, uh, you need to check with our office of non-prescription drug products. So thank you for that uh, that summary, Layla. Um, Tasneem, I'll, I'll direct the next one to you to sort of. Uh, summarize again, give the, uh, the condensed version of your uh, presentation on, uh, on deficiency letters. Can you summarize the letter process? Who is a letter sent to? 
Um, how long do they have to respond? What happens if they don't respond or, or if they can't fix it in time? Uh, can you just summarize that whole process? Sure, thank you, Paul. Um, I just want, so the deficiency letter is sent to the contact person that we have. Um, it would be the labeler contact um, that was sent to us in the labeler request SBL. And um, when we send the deficiency letter, we give them 30 days to correct. And um, if they correct within the 30 days and there are no issues, uh, the deficiency is you know, corrected properly, then we close the case and that's done. If they do not correct it within 30 days, then we move on to the next phase, which would be the data removal from the NDC directory, et cetera. And then we also send the firm a another email notifying them that it's been 30 days. We have not received any correction. So the data is being removed from the NDC directory. Um, after that, um, sometimes the firms, as Leila mentioned earlier, will correct it and um, they'll send a you know, correction and sometimes it needs an override. And I guess um, also wanted to mention that if it's a compliance case and if it's a compliance case that's been opened and when you're trying to correct it, you you end up with the, a validation error that will not let the submission pass, which means it needs a manual override. In that case, we, we request that you send it to us first. We asked you in the letter to send us an uh, email with the uh, submission ID or the core ID. And at that time, the uh, officer who opened the case will look at the submission, make sure that everything is corrected and that there are no other errors found. Then at that time, the CEDAR, our office will approve the override, but we do not actually process the override. Uh, the SPL coordinator actually processes it. So after we check everything and make sure that there's, you know, the correction has been made appropriately, then we will approve the override, but we will request the SPL coordinator to uh, actually perform the override. And, um, you know, as mentioned before, sometimes when there's no case involved, it, there are other times when there are um, different type of issues going on with, that need override, they, they will probably go directly to the SPL coordinator. But in general, if there's a case involved, the case has been open, we request that they send it to us. So after this is done and the override is performed, then we close the case and then the new SPL will be uploaded for everyone to see. It will be uploaded in our system and it will be back in the uh, directories after the case is closed. So that's generally how it works. Um, if there are any other questions, let me know. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Troy, uh, back to you. How, uh, and this is a question from the morning that I wanted to get to and couldn't. Um, how does someone delist uh, a specific package size without delisting the entire product? Thank you, Paul. So to, to delist a package size, um, all you have to do is go into the package section right and select the package code that you no longer want to be in a market and change the static date to uh, from active to complete and provide uh, the end date and that's how you um, delist the, um, the the packet side thank you very much uh, Layla back to you since uh, this is a, another Question from the morning. Um, it was for Sujin's NDC presentation, but if you can address this, it would be wonderful. Um, question is, how do I list an OTC product with an 11-digit NDC number? And I'll just add also any product, not just OTCs. What, what does somebody do if they have an 11-digit NDC and they need to list? Um, I will clarify again, as um, Dr. Parkmer mentioned in the morning, NDCs um, are 10 digits. You do not have an 11 digit NDC. You can um, change your NDC to an 11 digit HIPAA format by adding a leading zero to the short segment to make it a 542. But NDCs are um, 10 digits currently um, until we run out of five digit labeler codes. But um, they are 10 digits um, in, in three different formats, as it was discussed earlier, and you should list them as such uh, with their 10 digits um, for the purpose of drug listing and include them 
um, as 10 digits with the correct format on your labeling if you choose to print it on the drug label. Thank you very much. Uh, Julian, I'll give you some uh, some air time here um, and a bit of a curveball. It didn't really have much to do with your presentation, um, but can you speak to, we have a question or questions about getting, uh, updating labels on Daily Med or um, the FDA label repository. Can you s describe how that process works? How, how does what, how do they get updated? Uh, how long does it take for a change or a drug listing here at FDA to get to Daily Med? And if you don't want to take that, I'll give you the option. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. It's fine. The, um, so once you update your listing with FDA and you get a submission accepted, then that gets transmitted to Daily Med and FDA repository. So those are usually taken once a day. So depending on when you update it, when it's accepted, it may actually update that same day or the next business day. So that's usually the, um, the turnaround time for that. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Tazneem, um, here's one. I, yeah, I think it was from the earlier uh, session. Uh, in, I'll just read it uh, straight up here. In the OTC world, temporary bonus packs are a popular marketing device. Um, uh, for example, you get 75 tablets for the price of 60. Um, if someone has a drug product and wants to market a also a bonus pack of 75 tablets, does that require a new NDC number? Um, so I, I, I'll rephrase the question. Is it a is a new size of 75 tablets require a new bonus uh, or a new NDC number, even if they're just saying, hey, it's just a bonus of you're getting 15 free. Does that no. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. So that does not require a new NDC number. Um, uh, 207.35 will tell you exactly what a new NDC number is required. And a change in package size is not one of them. Um, you just need to get a new package code for that one. Yes, thank you. I, I want to uh, confirm or clarify. Yes, we. Uh, when she said no, a new NDC is not required. A new product NDC is not required. But as uh, as Tasneem correctly said, the new package size, a new package NDC, is required for the seventy five tablet size. Thank you. That's where. That's exactly what I was hoping to hear. And thank you for for pointing that out. Um, in our next. Oops, Sorry, lost my place here. Um, I'll take this next one. Um, again, going back to a question, we, we continue to get more questions about what if we had previously used a third party to submit our uh, registrations, our listings, um, and we now want to do it ourselves. This particular question said, if we are now using Cedar Direct, do we need to have that uh, third party delist and deregister the stuff that they added? And the answer to that is no. Um, you have simply, if you have taken over and have provided the most up to date versions of your SPL files, be it a registration or a listing, you now have control and or you now have the most recent version and you have version control. So there is no need. Um, and in fact, please do not instruct those third parties to delist because then you'll just have to list again. Um, uh, Layla, here's uh, one at, about um, more towards the um, definition of a relabeler and repacker. Uh, can relabel include putting a new label over an existing label or should product contain only one label? Well, by definition, it does. Overlabeling can be um, a, a relabeling um, activity, uh, but it's absolutely not advised to do so because of so many um, 
obvious reasons, um, you know, medication errors, um, losing the second label. So, so we don't advise you to do it, uh, but by definition, it can be included in the um, same definition as relabeling as it's uh, provided in the regulations. Thank you. Um, next question, actually, I'll, I'll field uh, since I mentioned it. This goes all the way back to my, uh, my opening presentation, and I mentioned the OTC monograph reform and the new uh, monograph IDs. There's a question about should, they, should companies um, now list, uh, when they list OTC monograph products, uh, should they reference the new monograph ID or should they continue to refer to the old uh, CFR Code of Federal Regulations citation? Um, and the answer to that is, hold on. Um, we haven't implemented anything yet. Um, if you are listing a brand new uh, product on, and it is compliant to one of the deemed final orders or the new um, uh, finished, uh, finalized uh, orders. Um, uh, yes, we are working to ensure that you can claim or you can use the new M001 or you know M and then a three-digit number convention to identify that monograph. But for those of you out there who have current drug listings and you have the previous uh, way of citing the OTC monograph using the CFR citation, for instance, part 347. Um, there is no need to do anything right now. Um, we are working out a, a transition plan and we will uh, communicate that with the world uh, when we have it. But again, for now, uh, no need to do anything in the immediate future. Um, back to Layla for another question about kits. You, you covered it, but I, I just to reiterate, because we didn't specifically mention cosmetics, but is it a kit if the other products are not drug products? And then the example they give, uh, for example, sunscreens in a kit with other cosmetics. Uh, they believe the answer is yes, but they would like the expert, Dr. Layla Raju Sfandiari, to answer that. Um, thank you. Yes, um, that would be considered a kit because um, products with SPF are considered um, drugs. So you will have one drug part and regardless of what the other parts are, it is supposed to be listed with us. In this case, if you have cosmetics, um, you, you can include the uh, parts, hopefully with a description um, of those parts. Um, and if they are um, other things that have their own identifiers, for example, if you have a medical device, um, include their own identifier, uh, such as a UDI in your drug listing. And uh, again, I'm just sort of going down the, the list of questions here. Uh, um, Tazneem, you did mention this earlier, but uh, since it was asked again, and it's a good thing to uh, remind people of, uh, who is notified when an incorrect NDC or establishment registration information is submitted? How, who gets the deficiency letter? The, the, label, the contact person that was uh, included in the registration SPL. Um, any, we we uh, communicate with the contact person uh, that was submitted, information that was submitted to us. So anytime, um, if it's a registration issue, it would be the registrant contact, um, labeler code issue, uh, labeler code contact, and for listing also, because we communicate uh, with uh, whoever the contact person is that was submitted to us. Thank you. And, and there was an earlier question this morning um, that I'll tie that answer into. Thank you for saying that. Tazneem, um, uh, someone asked, well, how do we enter multiple contacts for uh, our SPL? Well, just remember there, there's lots of opportunities for contacts. There is the contact 
for the labeler code, which will receive the listing deficiencies and, and other listing, drug listing and uh, product related uh, communications. There is a contact for the establishment, which we prefer to be someone at the establishment, um, but it does not have to be. There is a contact for the registrant. If, if there is a parent company or a, uh, a corporate office, the registrant contact and the establishment contact for a single registration can be different. And then we even still have for foreign companies, as we talked about, we have U.S. agents. So the U.S. agent um, uh, is, is, a, is another conduit of communication that we use. So again, please, as a reminder, keep these up to date, um, review them often, make sure you know, people change all the time in your, in your organizations. Um, check and make sure those emails are um, are up to date, or and if and and being monitored by someone in your organization uh, who's going to relay the, that information to the appropriate people. Uh, we see for those of you out there who are um, consultants who focus purely, and you are experts, perhaps as much or more than we are on SPL submissions. Um, if you do not want to be the regulatory contact for an establishment or a labeler code, if you do not want to see and receive deficiency letters on behalf of your clients, do not put your contact information in as the registration, the establishment, or the uh, uh, labeler code contact. Um, uh, we That just delays our vital communications um, to those who uh, who need it, and it gets you involved in some in the middle of something that you don't want to get involved with. And then I see we have thirty seconds, and I will uh, allow um, Layla to go overtime on this. But we have had uh, several questions about the whole contract manufacturer and private label distributor relationship, and who registers and who lists and who needs NDCs and labeler codes. So Layla, I would like you, if you uh, can, or if you don't, I'll, I'll, I can do it because I do like to listen to myself talk. Um, but can you please review that, uh, what the requirements are for each of those entities? So thank you for that question. Um, registration and listing requirements um, lie um, with the establishment, the manufacturing facility, whether if it's a contract manufacturing facility, a repackager, relabeler, whatever um, type of manufacturing activity you do, you are required to register. If you don't do any drug manufacturing activity, such as a private label distributor that just has drugs manufactured for them under a contract, um, you do not need to register with FDA. You should not register with FDA if you are only a PLD. Um, the drug listing requirements, as I mentioned, also is the responsibility of the establishment, uh, the registered establishment or the manufacturing facility. So if you are a contract manufacturing uh, organization that manufacture drugs for a private label distributor, you are required to register your facility and list the drugs um, on behalf of the PLD. Uh, there are two drug listings required in this case. One is the contract manufacturer's drug listing, which is um, uh, under contract manufacturer's labeler code and NDC. This um, drug listing is submitted under um, the manufactured under contract marketing categories and does not require inclusion of, um, of the entire labeling, only a, a carton label uh, with the contract manufacturer NDC or no NDC at all should be um, included as a JPEG to pass the validation. And then there is the private label distributors drug listing, which is under private label distributors label or code and NDC, which is a complete drug listing. The contract manufacturer is legally responsible to submit that on behalf of the private label distributor, but the private label distributor can choose if they want to uh, submit that information themselves directly. And by doing so, um, they, they basically accept responsibility for submitting an accurate and complete um, submission to FDA.
Okay, um, I want to thank all my panelists, both uh, from this afternoon's presentations and those who are online uh, for this morning. I'd also like to thank our presenters who weren't able uh, to be here today. Um, thanks to the SBAI, SBIA office um, and, and, our, uh, and our organizers of this event. And uh, this was a, a Herculean task and it is every year. Um, and uh, we we uh, and we enjoy this. We we uh, we appreciate how smoothly this all goes. Um, I would like to uh, now just close for everybody in the uh, audience out there tuned in. A, a big thank you to all of you for taking time out of your day to uh, to learn this stuff, to ask your questions, to clarify what you don't know. Um, we like it when people ask us questions about how to do it right before they do it, um, because it's, uh, as we say, uh, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, or whether you say measure twice and cut once. Um, it's just so much easier to do it right the first time and so much quicker and more efficient, even if it does take a little extra time than to spend all the resources on our end and on yours uh, trying to fix things. So with that, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to the final slide of the day here. Just some useful uh, contacts for you to ask your questions for all those questions. And we did get hundreds uh, today uh, that did not get uh, answered. Um, you may direct them to our eDuralist help desk. Uh, we have our Cedar Direct help desk uh, specifically for account and very technical things regarding, oh, how do I do this in Cedar Direct? Feel free to use that uh, resource as well. We have our SPL office there. Uh, as I said earlier, all OMUFO questions, please direct them to Cedar Collections. Um, uh, for questions that didn't get answered about the compounding and the product reporting, the outsourcing registered outsourcing facilities, you can direct those to our Office of Compounding Quality and Compliance. And then in general, for all those questions that may not have been just right there in the bullseye of what we wanted to talk about today in, um, in drug registration and listing, you can send all general questions regarding drugs and FDA and stuff uh, to our uh, CEDAR, our drug info office and our uh, office of communications. Um, with that, I'll uh, pass it off to Ray to close us out for the day.